check, check. MasterCard, Visa, check. Good evening. Good evening. So good to see you. It's a wonderful way to start a Wednesday evening Bible study worship to see that happen with Riley. Though I don't know her, my heart's uh, rejoicing uh, because of the circumstances there. And I know that you look forward to greeting your new sister and maybe uh, having a prayer together with her uh, after, after our lesson tonight. Now, in the back, were we able to get the lyrics to Cornerstone up there? Yep. Okay, Arden, this is your song. Okay, so this is Arden's uh, favorite song. Um, and I hadn't let it a lot, but we're going to make it through it. Love so familiar. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord. Just a little bit. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, we can make. In the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found, rest in His righteousness alone. This is the greatest thing in the world to be a Christian. Amen. That was pretty sorry. Let's try that again. Greatest thing in the world to be a Christian. Amen. Thank you very much for that. I've enjoyed being with these guys uh, this week. They uh, have a heart, I think, for, for... Okay, they have a heart for preaching. Now, I'm trying to get them to not say just ministers. They're not studying to be ministers. They're studying to be preachers. Every Christian is a minister. And every minister is a saint, and every saint is a priest, and every priest is a Christian. Now, as soon as we can get that out of our mind, that there is one minister who stands up here and does the sermon, and there's another minister who does the educational program, and another minister who does the youth program, well, the Louisville Church will never do as much as it can, because you ain't got but three ministers. But what if you had 600 ministers? And every one of you was a minister. And you knew what your ministry was. You knew what your gifts were. You get a lot more done. So they're not technically speaking training to be ministers unless you want to call it full-time ministry. That would be okay. But they're starting to be preachers because we all are to be ministers. Do your head this way if you understand. Every word in the Bible for minister that is, that is used of ministry is, uh, refers to both men and women. Men and women can be ministers in the Bible. The women ministered to Jesus. And so it is possible that we all have a ministry. Now I want to compliment the Louisville Church because um, you know that Joyce and I you know, are really close to the Jenkins and, and there's no way that I could adequately convey to you how much uh, beauty we have seen, uh, the beauty of Christ in you as you have responded uh, to the family and the events of the past few weeks and 
and how much that has impressed us. We already knew that you were a special church, but we see this. We know why uh, Laura loved you so much and why Jeff continues to love you so much. Um, I want to thank you for that because you have, uh, you have been excellent to them and I know that you will continue to be. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about a sermon, another sermon that Jeff said that I might preach. Uh, is it my favorite sermon? I don't know. It depends on whatever I've been studying lately. But I don't really have a favorite sermon per se because it kind of can change from one thing to the next. But right now this is kind of my favorite. So if we can have it up there, be still. Uh, and no, it's, um, it, I, it's on PowerPoint back there somewhere. Did we lose the ability to do that? We probably did. Arden, your song blew it up. There it is. Okay, Arden, I love you, and I hope that, uh, that you get strong again like you were at Red River and able to get around without your wheelchair and, and that kind of stuff. Okay, so be still and know. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And I have a clicker, so here we go. Um, I got my drink up here somewhere. I have a drink because, well, it's back there, because I have one kidney. My wife is a, was cruel. I had one kidney removed because of cancer, but I'm doing fine. It was three years ago. And so um, I was, you know how you sometimes, uh, whenever you talk about somebody who's pretty smart, and I'd say kidneys, so I did something that I thought was pretty smart. Thank you, Marks. I did something that I thought was pretty smart, and so I said kidneys, and Joyce said, you ain't got but one. Okay, so I do have one kidney, but uh, that's why I keep something to drink close, and uh, besides that, it's a cheap way of getting able to drink in the auditorium. All right, so let's then talk about, do you know that this is what Louisville, Texas looked like according to Applebee's, where we ate today? All right, this is what Louisville, Texas looked like a minute ago. I don't know when that was, but that was some time ago, and so look where you are now from wherever that was. I was just kind of wondering what church that, what church building that was at the time. But some of you here probably have seen this before. It's hanging in Applebee's and they told me it was Louisville, you know, in the early days. And so that's why I showed that for you and for no other reason except that I needed one more slide. Okay, so let's talk about the Esau syndrome. Be still and know. Be still and know. I am in no position to talk about this because I hate being still. My wife can tell you that this is true. She's back there somewhere saying amen. Okay, uh, she knows that I hate to stand in line. I hate to be in the line. Last night we were going to meet with Mark and Davy Hooper and eat at Mi Pueblo because apparently the law in Texas is you got to eat Tex-Mex at least three times every week. Okay, and so we were going to meet Pueblo and we were going to eat there and, and there was construction, of course. And being in a construction zone, it was like, oh man, what in the world? And I am a very impatient person. Matter of fact, I'm so impatient that my daughters, I have four daughters. Why? Because we don't want five. However, we got, we got eight grandchildren and we would like to have more of them. You should have grandchildren first. Okay, they are really pretty cool. Anybody here have grandchildren? Can I get an amen out of you, anybody? Amen. All right, all right, so they're pretty cool. All right, so one of my... Uh, one of my children said, Dad, Dad, you're not going to go to hell, but if you do go to hell, Satan's going to put you in this long line and it's never going to move. Okay, that's exactly, that's exactly me. I am that person. So I, have, I want you to know that I'm not qualified to really talk about this, except I need to. You ever been in circumstances where you know that you're not supposed to struggle? Because you struggle, and the more you struggle, the worse it makes it, except you can't seem to help yourself. It's like, I, I don't swim well, but when my wife was trying to teach me to, to swim when I was 27 years old, uh, when she was trying to teach me to, to swim, she said, then you got to relax. I can't relax. I'm going to die. I mean, you, can, you cannot expect me to relax when I'm going to die in this water. No, 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 you've got to relax. You'll float better if you relax. I float on the bottom. Okay, and so don't ask me not to struggle. Or here's one. I've never had done this before. But if a bear attacks you, Probably not going to happen here in this part of Texas. But if a bear is going to attack you, what you're supposed to do is play dead. If you run, he can run at 35 miles an hour, and you can run at about 6. Okay, so he is going to get you, so don't struggle. Or another one I can think of is this. You're in, you're in quicksand, and the more that you want out of the quicksand, you know, the more you struggle and struggle, and the more you do, the faster you sink. So struggle is really the idea, not just being still. But I don't want you to struggle, the Lord says. Man, this is a difficult lesson for Brother Ralph, and hopefully it'll help you too. 
Now, I'm calling this the Esau syndrome. Why? Because Esau wanted it, and he wanted it now. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. We have a couple of Jacobs here this week, and we talked about this today, because Jacob means he who holds to the heel. Isaac was 60 years old when, when the, his wife gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter. He was a buck and bass sort of guy. He was a bass pro sort of guy. He was a Gander Mountain sort of guy. He was on the cover of every hunting magazine, filled and stream and everything else that's out there because he was naturally that sort of guy. On the other hand, there was Jacob. Now Jacob was more of an HGTV sort of guy. He was more of a... Discovered Channel. He was more of a, he was more of a flip, flip it or you know bow and, and chip you know in Waco, Texas. I'm, let's flip this house. You know, let's do that sort of stuff. Now, there's no indication that Jacob at all had an unusual sexual orientation, shall we say? But it does mean that he was different from his brother, and so he finagled his way. Do y'all use that word in Texas? He made a way to make it happen so that he could get the birthright. Because if you get the birthright, sorry girls, but girls didn't get the birthright then, but the guys did. If there's two sons, the oldest son gets half, and the second son gets a fourth. Uh, or, or gets, it will get twice as much. All right, so actually if there's two sons, the oldest will get two-thirds, and the younger son will get one-third. All right, so the oldest son's going to get twice as much, but in, in exchange for that, he's in charge of the family. All right, so Esau had this birthright, but he was so hungry. He'd been rabbit hunting or, or deer hunting or whatever else. And man, the smell of the stew that was coming from the camp. I don't know if Jacob planned it this way or not, but there he was in his granite-covered uh, countertops. You know, he was making this, and I bet he was making it up upwind so that the wind could hit Esau when Esau was coming in because Jacob wanted that birthright and said, yeah, I'll give you all the food that you want. The only thing you've got to do is sell me your birthright. Well, Esau wanted it and he wanted it now. I want it now. Remember that uh, Willy Wonka and the, and the chocolate factory? Give it to me. Well, good things did not happen to this child. You know, because she wanted it and she wanted it now. And then I got to thinking, you know, this is behind so much of everything that's going on in our world today, which is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Actually, every sin is connected to the lust of the flesh, something that you must have that you're willing to do bad things for to get it with your flesh, or something that you see with your eyes, Somebody else has an RV that's bigger than yours or a car that's faster than yours and you got to have it. Or here's one that's better. Somebody has a, a, the newest of the iPhone. They have an iPhone XR or they have a Samsung doodah, doodah, doodah and you've got to have it although it costs $1,000. You've got to have it because it is the fastest and the best. You've got to have it. Now why? Well, because you've got to have it and you've got to have it now. Lust of the eyes. You see it, you want it. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, vain glory of life. Now, the weird thing about sin is, is that all of these have a legitimate place. For instance, there's nothing wrong with you seeing something and deciding that you want to do it. For instance, you see somebody with a, with a PhD and you decide, someday I want to do that. Well, that's not necessarily wrong, depending on what you're willing to do to, go to, to, to get it done. If you're willing to cheat to do it, then, then it becomes a sin. But it's not necessarily wrong to see something and say, I want that. Someday, you know, I want, you know, to be in this situation. Someday I want to retire when I'm 50 years old, whatever. Okay, and so you see that not necessarily a bad thing until it becomes a sin. And when it becomes a sin, it's when you're willing to do anything in order to do it. You want it and you want it now. Isn't it odd that your children often want their first salary to be what your last salary was? In other words, you have worked your whole life to get to a certain point, and now all of a sudden your kids, you know, go to college and they think that their first, you know, job should be $100,000 or, or whatever in a, you know, uh, an expense account and all this business. You might be lucky enough to have that, but if you do, I hate you. 
I just want you to know that I, there's a meme on Facebook about the, about, let me tell you what, what your 401k was then. It was hauling hay. It was building stuff. It was working hard. And I, know, I believe that your generation knows about working hard, and I believe that you can work hard, and I believe that many of you are willing to work hard to do it, but it is not just about what you see that you want or what you have to have or what you know you are willing to sell out for because you are arrogant and you, you think too highly of yourself, that would be the basis of every sin. So every one of those three has a legitimate place because God made you this way, but if you take it to the extreme, then it becomes a sin. Well, okay, so then we ask the question, well, what about being still? Uh, Psalm 46 and verse 10, be still means to stop striving or fighting against it and know that I am Yahweh. In 2 Chronicles 32, the context of this is about Hezekiah. Hezekiah is the dude who prayed that he would live for 15 more years and God extended his life because he was such a good king. Levi, king of Judah, good guy. Did good things. All right, here's the problem with Hezekiah, however. He's looking at a mighty army led by Sennacherib who is an Assyrian king who eventually is going to cause the fall of Babylon and then he wants more and more and more and more land. He's the guy responsible in 721 BC for taking over the northern part, i.e. Israel. And now here, here he is about 15 years later and he's besieging Judah. And now he wants more and more and more. The problem is, is that we as members of the church often feel outnumbered. Why? Because there's usually not many of them in your class. Unless you go to a Christian academy or something, there's usually not members of the, many members of the Church of Christ in your class. And so you feel outnumbered. If you decide that you're not going to drink, you know, you're going to be outnumbered. If you decide that you're not going to try recreational drugs, you're going to be outnumbered. If you choose to be a virgin intentionally until you get married, you're going to be outnumbered. Because that's the way that most people are going to think the opposite of. And there you are feeling outnumbered like Israel is feeling outnumbered. So here's what Hezekiah had them to do. I want you, uh, my sub-commanders, my commander, you know, that right under me, I want you to go out there and tell all Israel, be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. Go out there and tell them, be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. Spread this message throughout the camp that God is with you. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us, the Sennacherib that would be, but with us, the Lord our God who owns this world, he is with us, and greater is he who is in you than he is in the world. And the people took confidence with the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. We learn later on in 2 Kings 19, verse 35, they began to have confidence, but it wasn't clear how this was going to happen until one night Isaiah says, now look, God's going to take care of you, he said to Hezekiah. And so one night the angel of the Lord came and killed 185,000 Assyrians. One night. And the next day they got up and there were bodies strewn everywhere because the Lord God had taken care of this. But we often feel like, well, that's going to happen to other people, but it's not going to happen to me. And so as we think about this, remember... That's what he was trying to say to them. God is going to take care of you. So be still and know. Stop struggling and know these three things tonight. Number one, I want you to know that God is your refuge. He's your refuge and your strength. Being your refuge and your strength, he's a personal refuge. I don't know where you like to go for refuge, but sometimes when you have a medical test that you don't actually want to go through, uh, sometimes the nurse will say to you, you need to go to your happy place. And if somebody were to say to you, would you go to your happy place, where would it be? I don't know if it would be, you know, the Galveston or one of the islands in Texas. I don't know if it would be somewhere in Red River and those beautiful mountains. I don't know if it would be Colorado. 
I don't know if it'd be the Gulf, you know, most of our people go to the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know where it would be. You go to your happy place. God is your refuge. He's the one who's going to take care of you. God is our refuge. And he's also a very present help in trouble, which means he can help you when other people cannot do this. There is only one of the things that, that's bad about men and good about men is that we are fix it. Now, this is a stereotype. It's not always true because there's women who can fix it too. Melissa, I happen to know some of the things that you can do. All right, so, all right, so there are some people. Uh, she can skin a deer and, and stuff, which most women probably would not do before breakfast. All right, but whenever you think about that, I, this is not always true, but I'm going to give you a stereotype. Here's a stereotype. Men are fix it and women are feel it. Now, women are very intelligent. i got four daughters, did I tell you? And uh, one of them got an MBA when, by the time she was 21 years old. And uh, another one is teaching high school math. And uh, another one is teaching the fifth grade. And another one has about 15,000 hours of alcohol and drug addiction counseling. And she's an interior designer. And I know that girls are smart. I know that you're really smart. I know that. But I also know that men happen to, happen to think about, I can fix that for you. All right, so your child comes to you and say, Dad, can you fix this toy? Of course I will. What I'm secretly going to do, however, is I'm going to Walmart and buy a new one. You know, but what? But I can fix that toy. I can't. Why? Because I am your dad, and I fix stuff. Your child says, can you open this? You bet I can open it, or I'll break my wrist. I just want you to know that I can open this because I fix stuff. Dad, there's something wrong with the car. Can you fix it? Yes, I can fix it. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's going to run, but I can fix it. There's something that I can do because I am a guy. Well, Dad, can you fix this? Sometimes that's going to happen with your family, and it's going to become obvious to you that that's above your pay grade. You cannot fix spiritual stuff without the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, anybody? You cannot fix it without him. And I don't care how, how you are used to trying to fix stuff. There will be a situation where that will be the case. So I had to learn this with my daughters. They'll say, Dad, I want to talk to you. Okay. Do you want me to try to fix it or do you want me to listen? And at that point then, they'll tell me, I want you to just listen. Oh, you mean I don't have to shoot anybody or anything? No, you just listen. Okay. Just listen. And so you listen as your daughter tells you whatever it is that's on her heart because your first tendency is to try to fix it when it might be beyond your capacity to fix. And so whenever you think about the Lord God, that's his area. He is ready for you to say, I cannot do this myself. My daughter, who was on drugs and alcohol, I learned a little bit of the 12 steps. I know the first three. I can't, he can, and I will. That's how the Alcoholics Anonymous abbreviate the first three steps. Number one, my life has become unmanageable over alcohol, and I cannot fix it. I cannot fix it. Number two, therefore, I will put it into the hands. I will. I will put it into the hands of the higher power as best I understand him. And then I will comply. I will do what I am supposed to do in order to get over this terrible situation that I'm in. I can't. He can. I will. Sounds like every Christian to me, doesn't it? I can't. I cannot. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. I am up to here in my transgressions and my sins and they're about to swallow me whole. I can't. He can and therefore I will submit. That's what I will do. We were looking for that day from our daughter and we tried to force it and we never really were able to do that. But two years in prison... And having an excellent Christian counselor who would come a couple of days a, work and a week and talk to her and, you know, told her that she was meant for more than that. God meant for her to have a life that was more than that. Are you convinced of that personally? 
that God means for you to have a better life than you are now living some of you that you are better than that that you are made in the image of God and God does not want you to have to live in the misery that you're living in do you see therefore that he is your powerful refuge and he's always 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 going to be there that's the thing about a permanent refuge. The permanent refuge is he is a very present help in trouble and he is a very present help meaning that he will always be present because he is permanent. Therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Now the second point that's made in, in Psalm 46 is this. God is your river. Now you might think, well, what in the world is that all about? Sometimes Joyce and I get amused at all the names of the new churches that are springing up all over Texas and other places. And notice that many of them don't even have any reference to Christ whatsoever. Like one of them that, I'm, that I saw was just called the Fellowship Church. Well, you could have fellowship whether or not you were a Christian. I mean, would you think that maybe some idea that this church belongs to Christ would be a good idea? Maybe putting his name on there would even be a pretty good idea because it belongs to him. It's not me. I can't do this. And so, be still and know him as the river. Now, I cannot prove this, but what I'm about to say is a little speculation. Now, Jeff has been in Hezekiah's tunnel before. Hezekiah decided that... Jerusalem was vulnerable because of their water supply. Because they got most of their water from a spring outside the walls of Jerusalem. If anybody wanted to take over the city, the only thing they had to do was divert the water supply. And then all of a sudden, you know, it doesn't matter how strong you are, after three or four days with no water, you give up. So what he did then, he thought, you know, if I can build a tunnel from the Gihon Spring all the way to the Siloam Fountain, then no enemy will ever be able to divert the water away from us and we'll always have a permanent water supply. And so he did it. It was an engineering feat, maybe a miracle. They began digging at each end a tunnel of 777 feet. There were no transits. There was no technical, you know, uh, any sort of thing or no computer mapping. There were no drones. How do you figure out if you're going in a straight line? How do you figure that out? And they met together and made that tunnel. That's the river. I wonder if Hezekiah is, is the Thomas is thinking about the fact that Jesus is your river. I used to like to fly, and the only reason I don't like to fly anymore is I've discovered that I teach at Fried Hardeman, and those two are not compatible. Okay, because then you've got to have more money than i got to fly. But I do have my pilot's license, and one of the things that I would like to do, maybe on a cool evening, is get in a small plane and just follow the river. You follow the river, you're going to find two-thirds of the population. And if you don't find it by the river, you'll find it by some other water supply. Because there are going to be all those places that have cropped up right there beside the river. And why is that? The water supply. That's why. And so Jesus is your permanent supply of water. Do you have Jesus in your life? There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The, the nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The host of hosts, the Lord of hosts, is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And why is that? Because there is the fact that you need to know that God is going to be your permanent source of sustenance. He's going to be your river. And then, since he is your river, that means then, I wonder about, you know, the images of, of uh, even heaven itself. Or the fact that the Garden of Eden was between four rivers, two of which we know the location of and two of which we don't know the location of. But there it was because that's the way that God wanted it. Well, if you were this Samaritan woman who had come down from Mount Gerizim 
with this big old heavy pot on your head. Boy, don't you know she would love to have had Tupperware. Okay, but she had this huge pot on her head, and it's heavy, and she's going down the mountain, but then she's going to get all this water at eight pounds a gallon, and she's got to take it back up the mountain. And Jesus begins to, to talk to her using a didactic moment, which is a moment of teaching, and, and said to her, would you like to have an inexhaustible supply of water? Oh, yes, I would. And so he began to talk to her about the fact that, he, that she could have the water of life even, even though she had five husbands and the man that she was with was not her husband. Therefore, Hezekiah's tunnel was kind of, you know, built along uh, that line right there. And here it is. I haven't been there. I've been to the entrance of it, but I have not been inside it like some of you have. Um, and so what we see then is that some of the oldest archaic Hebrew script in the world has been written on those rocks inside that tunnel because Hezekiah wanted everybody to know that it was Yahweh who was really responsible for the completion of that tunnel. And then the third thing that God wants you to know tonight is that you need to stop struggling not only because he's the river you know but because now he's also the ruler. He's your refuge, he's the river, he's your ruler. It seems to me that one of the things that is most difficult for us to do, whenever your kids are little, how long does it take? Okay, so we got an 18 month old grandson. It's funny right now, whenever his mother is uh, trying to teach him the meaning of no, because I think that Sister Laura had a little expression like payback is sweet. All right, and so, uh, and so it's kind of funny to watch our oldest daughter struggle with him because our oldest daughter was so headstrong. And so uh, he was over at the house, and, and he was messing around with the beast jar, well, with the, with the buttons on the, on the TV stuff, and Joyce said, no. Okay, it's hard to say this to your grandson, but you can do it. Okay, and so he said, and so he, he sat there like this, 18 months old. He sat there like this. He'd look every once in a while at Gigi, that's her name, and then he'd look back. He'd look at Gigi, and he'd look back. That's every one of us. We're stubborn. We want what we want. And we want it now. Therefore, if, if everything was given to you like that, I didn't, I didn't understand my daddy. I had a 57 Chevrolet when I went up to Fred Hardeman. And uh, I, I might have let a lot of people borrow it. And it could have been that the early gas bills with Philip 66 were a little more than my dad thought that they should be. So he said to me one time when I was home, he said, uh, he said, son, are you, uh, you letting people borrow your car? So I said, well, yeah. He says, well, where are they taking it to, Honolulu? Okay, and so uh, I kind of thought, well, that was a good way to make friends, let them borrow your car, right? But then uh, whenever I had to start paying for my own gas, well, that came to a screeching halt. And then when you had to buy your own tires, and then that other stuff, all of a sudden then, that means now be still and know him as ruler. You've got to come to understand that he rules over your life. And in this ruling process, there's a call to behold. Look at how God sent one angel to destroy the entire Assyrian army. And Sennacherib left and went back home. You know, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. But it's not easy. Um, we were on a cruise ship celebrating Joyce's uh, uh, getting rid of cancer, so we thought. And so we flew into San Juan, Puerto Rico. And we, were, uh, we had a couple of friends with us, uh, Visa and MasterCard. And uh, so we were going to take a little celebration cruise, you know, because... Well, we weren't out of the port eight hours before she was in extreme pain. And uh, she had a blockage. No place to get sick on a cruise ship. I'm telling you, no place to get sick. Uh, we happen to have our own Schedule II narcotics with us because they do not give them to you on the cruise ship. And she was hurting, but there's no place for us to land until the next morning. The Isle of St. Croix. And the doctor was saying, she's going to have to have emergency surgery. And I'm thinking, great. Chickens in the surgery room, you know, Cheech and Chong with a reefer. You know, we're kind of thinking somehow or another, oh, great. This is going to be a wonderful place for her to have surgery. 
Her blood pressure uh, that night got up to 240 over 140. And we were preparing for her to die. Well, as God would have it, there happened to be a Palestinian surgeon at that little dinky hospital who was there to teach their surgeons. And he had happened to have done the first laparoscopic gastric bypass in the country. And he had offices two blocks from the White House. And he did her surgery. He was non-believing. So I said to him, why are you here? He said, what do you mean, why are you here? I said, why are you here? I mean, she's moved by ambulance from the cruise ship. We stayed there six days. By the way, all the islands from inside of a hospital room look very much the same. Why are you here? He was a non-practicing, perhaps non-believing Muslim. Born in Turkey with some Palestinian background, but actually born in Turkey. And so, before we left, I said to him one more time, I said, why are you here? Do you see things with these eyes? Or with the eyes of your heart? Do you see them? I've got to admit that since Laura and Joyce were such great friends, we feel a little guilty, you know, about the fact that we're still here and she's not. But she believed until the very end in her eyes of faith. Be still. Now, is this all going to work out? Well, no, we didn't get what we prayed for. It's not going to work out. Well, do you know that our worst day was Laura's best day? And that quit struggling. You can't fix it all. This is meant to be a temporary place at best. You're only here for a small amount of time. And it will go so incredibly fast that nobody will be able to tell you. It's like trying to explain how deep the Grand Canyon is to somebody who's never seen the Grand Canyon. It will go by so incredibly fast. So what's the advice that the psalmist wants to give to you? Stop struggling. I'm in charge. Stop struggling. You won't be able to do all this yourself. But I can take one of my angels. It's not even any indication that he was a special angel. I mean like Joe Angel. He sent one of his angels. And 185,000 people died. That's the God that you serve. Stop. You're struggling. You're fighting against it. When as a matter of fact, God will always be there because of time and because I've heard of Bill. We're going to skip to the end here. This song is based on, uh, on Psalm 46. I hope you know it. Hide me now under your wings. Come within your mighty hand when the oceans rise and thunders roar I will soar with you above the storm Father you are king over the flood I will be still and know you are God my soul in Christ alone know his power in quietness and trust when the oceans rise and thunders roar I will soar with you above the storm Father you are king 
flood I will be still and know you are God do we end with the invitation well I'm guilty of it trying to manipulate and force and trying to make sure that it turns out my way I'm guilty of it maybe you are too trying to manipulate it and force it rather than just stop your struggling that doesn't mean stop your study it doesn't mean stop your ambition that's worthwhile it does not mean be lazy or complacent but it means when you have done what you can do to turn loose and trust that's what it means we are not good at it many of us who are in the church because we still want what we want and it's hard to understand what it means like when you were two years old and your dad says to jump and you're off a table and and your child just trusts you by jumping into your arms where are you in your relationship with God tonight? Are you struggling? Are you stuck? Have you stopped growing spiritually? It's not news exactly what Jeff told Riley tonight to do to become a Christian. It's exactly the same thing that the Bible says for all of us. For many of us, we've been Christians a long time, but we've still had trouble turning loose. We've had trouble letting go. And we have had trouble being still and knowing that He is God. While we stand and sing.